And so yeah, I'm Anita, I'm a New Zealand registered nutritionist and I'm going to talk today about diet for ME CSF and um, especially with regards to things like easy meal prep and but we'll touch on other things as well like things like food intolerances and just other things specific to to your needs um, so we'll talk i'll talk first and then i'm more than happy to open up for questions once i've given, given the talk and you can spend a bit of time on that and welcome everybody it's nice to be out and about a bit mm. i've been doing quite a bit of zooming as well during this time and it's it's so much nicer just to see people <laughs> talking to a screen so so just to start with, I'm just going to talk about kind of getting a diet right with ME and, and why it's important, because it's important for everyone to get their diet right, but there are just a, some particular concerns that you might want to think about when making your food choices in terms of the best food choices to support your body during this specific time. And so firstly, one thing we do know is that in people with ME-CFS, there can be changes in inflammation and inflammatory pathways. So that means that you might be more inclined towards inflammation and sore, sore fibromyalgia type conditions, and also um, slight dysregulation of inflammation in the body. So from a dietary perspective, what you can do is, is try and select foods which will help modify or influence or reduce inflammation so we know that there's some foods that do do that so they're an important group to consider when you're kind of putting together your diet and the second um point is that uh you want to try and support the energy within your cells as much as possible so has everyone come across this term mitochondria so i think it's yes it's spoken about isn't it so mitochondria, these little powerhouses or motors within the cell. And you really want to make sure that you're eating an optimal diet that will actually help to fuel that mitochondria and help it work more efficiently. And also to help reduce the kind of damage to the mitochondria from something called oxidative stress. So you kind of want to choose foods that, that, that you know will help with that too, because that, that makes sense to do that so those are two key points and um the final point is that you want to also support your microbiome diversity so increasingly we're beginning to understand more about um our gut health and the way that our gut health might influence our body i think we used to think of the gut as this little kind of area that was separate from the body like this big tube in, in, inside us but now we realize that the type of bacteria that we have in our gut and the amount and the variety does have some effect on the body. And we're talking, there's a lot of talk about something called the gut brain access. So we're realizing that what's going on in the gut can influence how we feel in ourselves and our brain and our cognitive function, which is something and cognitive function and also in feelings of fatigue and brain fatigue so the gut can influence that area and the gut can also influence inflammatory pathways as well so sometimes changes in the gut microbiome can make us more likely to be inflamed so those three areas are, are, are worth considering when you're selecting your diet so first is mitochondrial health second is inflammation and third is kind of microbiome diversity and some of this is becoming more apparent now with different research into the microbiome. So dysbiosis is when you have, I suppose, more unfriendly bacteria in the gut. I will talk a bit more about this later on, um, but I just wanted to introduce the key themes. So, so yeah supporting that microbiome health some of the things that might help with that is selecting more what we call pre and probiotic food so prebiotic food is kind of like the food you can see it is like the food that would feed the soil so it's like feeding the the soil in which the the healthy bacteria can grow 
So we want to make sure we're having those. And that I'll give you more detail later, but that might be things like lots of good types of fiber, types of oats and seeds and so forth. And also um, even a variety of vegetables will help to feed the, the, the prebiotic uh, area in our gut. So healthy prebiotics, so that means that the probiotics or the healthy varieties of bacteria are well fed and well nurtured within the gut. So we need those pre and probiotic type foods. And we also want foods of a variety of colors. So some, um, now we, the more we understand about food variety, the more we understand about the impact that it can have on our health. So all of the different little colored pigments in food, for example, your beetroots, your lovely purple beetroots, or your yellow carrots, or your dark green leafy vegetables, all those different uh, plant chemicals actually help to influence different bacteria in the gut and grow different types of bacteria to support different types. Hello. I think that's good for time. Yes, absolutely. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. And 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 there is even research saying that having a trying to have up to 30 different types of fruits and vegetables in your diet weekly will help to grow that diverse microbiome. So yeah, that's absolutely right. So so pre and probiotic food, variety of different colours. Less processed food. So we've all kind of heard that processed food isn't great for us, but now we're actually understanding that people whose diets is uh, people who eat more processed food in the diet actually have a slightly different microbiome. It actually affects the variety of bacteria that are grown because processed food isn't necessarily a great soil for probiotics to grow on. So all of these things can influence it. And also a yeah, variety of suitable fibers as well. So protecting your microbiome is, is key. And we'll talk about a few ways to do that. And the final point is trying to aim for slightly for steady blood sugar levels. And what that means is you, you want to try and move away from a food pattern where, for example, you're hungry and you have sugary foods and your blood sugar levels go up and then you feel good for five or ten minutes or half an hour and then you begin to feel hungry again as those blood sugar levels drop and you haven't got a lot of sustained energy to keep them up because the sugar gets burned really fast. So if you if you um, you know, have fatigue then having those ups and downs of blood sugar levels will probably contribute and certainly not help those, those feelings of fatigue. So looking at ways that you can keep well nourished, keep quite a nice steady intake of food and also choose foods that don't tend to spike your blood sugars up and down. And mostly the foods that will do that are foods that are in the whole state. Because for example, if an apple had three grams of sugar in it, when you have that sugar in the apple, all the fiber in the apple means that when you eat it, the blood sugars are more steadily rising because they've got fiber, which puts the brakes on the sugar levels going up. Whereas if it was three grams of just sugar on its own, then suddenly you'll go up, you'll feel the energy fast and come down again. So just to summarize, I think that would be the four key things to keep in mind. And I'll try and give you some practical ideas about how to do that. But yeah, reduce inflammation, steady blood sugar levels, feed your microbiome forest, and feed your little mitochondria as much as you can. So they could be your four basic guidelines. Um, okay, just get to the next slide. Oh, I've got to. That's that one. Lovely. And I love this picture because I think it illustrates really nicely. I mean, this is just showing the stomach, but just imagine that's the whole gut. But this is showing us really nicely um, or illustrates the idea that the gut, our gut microbiome or gut health should be a bit like a rainforest. So when you look at that picture, you can see quite a few different plants and flowers and different species. So that's what we want our gut to be like. We want to have, it, have nice high numbers of a great variety of different microbes in there. As opposed to, um, so that would be like a rainforest versus a field which is just growing one crop. So if you imagine if you, when you look at a crop which is just growing corn, you know, that's just one species. 
but you want diversity. You want the rainforest, you want lots of different foods to influence lots of different bacteria in the gut. And that is going to have an influence on lots of areas in the body. So, so when you make that, add in that extra vegetable in your daily intake, just think that you're, that's what you're creating inside you, that you're, you have diversity. So that's the ideal, okay? That's, that's ideally how we want to be eating. Um, so, however, we do need to think about the fact that there are some specific nutritional challenges or gut challenges that people with any CFS might face. And uh, some of these might be familiar to some of you. Um, and these certainly are things one might experience. It doesn't mean that you experience them all of them, and it doesn't mean you experience all of them all the time either. But um, so certainly nausea can be an issue sometimes. Um, the other one is just loss of appetite. So you know, you're hungry, but you just you're tired, but you're just not really very hungry. All of those kind of gut symptoms, bloating, diarrhea, stomach cramps, and so forth, can be can come alongside. So night sweats is another symptom, and you might think that doesn't relate specifically to your gut, but it can relate to hydration. So if you are actually sweating at night and you're going to be thirstier, you're going to have a drier mouth, so you want to make sure that you're getting enough fluids in to meet that need as well. You also might have increased sensitivity to foods. So things like coffee and alcohol could be good examples of that. And that could be because the way that your nervous system responds to stimulants is a bit different from maybe how it used to or from other people that when when it gets stimulated when, when you take on caffeine it activates the sympathetic or fight or flight part of the nervous system and your body's just not quite as good at, at breaking down those chemicals and getting rid of them so um for some people maybe avoiding coffee or at least drinking it early in the day rather than before you go to sleep or the latter part might be important. And it's a little bit the same with alcohol, that the body's just not quite as good at breaking it down. Or there can be chemicals in alcohol, even natural chemicals called histamines and salicylates, which your body just doesn't tolerate as well. So that's sensitivities and also food intolerances. So there could be certain foods that you just know don't suit you, make you feel bloated, make you feel sore, and um, that's, that's often worth investigating. Um, the other consideration is that dizzy spells and something called orthostatic hypertension can be an issue. Has anyone had issues with that? Yep. Okay. Then there are some quite specific recommendations about around making sure that your salt intake is adequate. So, um, you know, generally we're suggesting that people need to keep their salt intake down because it's not great for heart health. However, in some specific situations, you might need to make sure that you're getting enough salt in. So those are individualized guidelines. Uh, there are people who also have an increased risk or association with IBS or irritable bowel syndrome. So those things can coexist. And there does seem to be some relationship between MECS, CFS, and uh, inflammatory bowel disease as well. So I, IBS is, is, is doesn't involve inflammation per se, whereas inflammatory bowel disease, things like Crohn's disease and osteocolitis, there might be an association there. So, and a lot of these things might contribute to the final point there, which is nutrient deficiencies. So, for example, if you've got a lot of bloating or loose bowels because your gut can't tolerate food, then it might mean that the food's traveling too fast through your gut and you're not absorbing everything or not absorbing optimally. Also, if, if your um, appetite's poor or you're just fatigued and not able to always prepare optimal food, then you may experience certain nutrient deficiencies. And the other one that comes to mind is things like vitamin D, where maybe you're not out in the sun, um, optimally, and a lot of us you know, are prone to vitamin D deficiency in New Zealand, or low vitamin D, then, then nutrient deficiencies are, are definitely worth considering and, and trying to get more. Yes, hello. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think 
Yeah, there's a relationship absolutely between calcium and vitamin D and bone health. Yep. <laughs> okay, so this is a lovely, so what should you eat? So um, this is a, a kind of idealized look at an, at an optimal kind of diet pattern, really. Um, this isn't talking about specific foods. And we do know that a kind of Mediterranean style of eating is, is, is useful. Um, and the reason why is because it involves anti-inflammatory or inflammatory modulating foods like olive oil and oily fish, nuts and seeds. So they all are really helpful. It also does involve legumes and so things like lentils and beans, which are great for the microbiome. It's tending a little bit more towards lower saturated animal fat and it emphasizes lots and lots of fruit and vegetables. So as an ideal pattern, the idea of five plus fruits and vegetables a day, whole grains, legumes, extra virgin cold pressed olive oil, and also oily fish and herbs and spices is a great pattern to go towards. Herbs and spices are especially useful because you remember we talked about trying to get those 30 different types of vegetables in or fruits every week, which can be a challenge. Your herbs and spices can help with that. Because if you're having a herb, that's giving you lots of those lovely chemicals which your gut might buy up on. So you yeah, really make friends with those and find one, uh, herbs and spices that you can include in your diet that you enjoy. And they also make the food taste better as well. So that's your ideal kind of plan of, of, of um, what your, your diet might want to look like. However, we do know that what's ideal and what's achievable can sometimes be different things and that as a group you might have some unique challenges to achieving that diet. So one is that, um, is that prepping food takes time and energy. So you know, eating that optimal whole food diet with no processed food, and no sugars is perfect. And if you've got a full-time chef on staff, brilliant. <laughs> I haven't. Um, I don't know, maybe some of them do, but um, it's, it's challenging. So one of the challenges is, is, time, is fatigue. So how are you going to manage to eat that optimal diet when you're fatigued? Another challenge is that, yes, you know lentils are good for you, and you know that broccoli is good for you, but your gut can't handle it. So what are you going to do? Are you going to, it's, you know, is there another food that could work as well? Or do you just have to find the, the right dose of that food that you can tolerate. So for example, a couple of stalks of broccoli are fine, but half of, of but a cup's too much. So it's, you know, individualizing and working out how you're gonna get these principles to work for you. And work for you long-term, because what we do know with diet is it's really what you do most of the time that's important. So it's, it's less about what you do, um, you know, for three days. It's about finding a way that you can manage it long-term. And the other barrier that can get in the way of this eating is that it's just expensive. And, um, you know, long, yeah. no, and food inflation was at 7% at the moment. It's a real, real, it was always challenging and now it's really challenging. So then it really comes down to figuring out, you know, what, what are the most, most nourishing foods I can, I can incorporate into my diet that aren't going to break the bank. I mean, there's a beautiful organic crackers in the supermarket and they're, $15 for a little packet. That, that might not be the thing, but there might be other foods that are more within your budget that you can bring into your diet that are going to give you benefits. And there are foods like that. It doesn't all have to be super, super expensive stuff. And the final one, which I'm sure you'll all be familiar with, is gosh, the advice is just confusing. You know, you, you go onto the internet and Someone will say you should be high fat, someone low fat, and it is terribly confusing. So where do you go to find the good advice? And that, that's really important. So those are four kind of barriers that get in the way of, of choosing your optimal diet. And we're going to try and break those down one by one so that you've got a few, uh, some resources and ideas about where to go with those. So the first one's around that food just doesn't suit me. So we know that people with any CSF can have um, a higher uh, instance of, of food intolerances or IBS and so on. So it's a question of finding out if you do have them and what you can do about it. So I'm going to just mention some really common ones and this absolutely doesn't mean that you have to take these foods out or these foods are a problem for you because it really is individual. But so one 
food group that some people have problems with is things is high lactose foods. So things like milk, ice cream, custard, and yogurt to some degree. So that's foods that have a, the carbohydrate portion of the dairy product, the lactose. If that's high, they can't digest it and it gives you bloating and diarrhea and it's not a great food for you. Although it's a very nutritious food to eat. So, um, so for some people that, that, that food group can be an issue. And it's really important to remember with food intolerances is if you take a food group out of your diet, you want to be really careful that you replace it with something that's going to be as nutritious. So for example, dairy products are really high in calcium and high in protein. So if you take them out, what are you going to use instead? Because taking food out might help your symptoms, but it might not help your little mitochondria health because you might get the nutrients you need. So, um, so lactose is, is one, one of the many foods that could be an issue. And the other group is a group of which lactose actually is one, is are called FODMAPs. So has anyone heard of those? Yeah. So they're a group of um, carbohydrates that the body might find hard to break down and digest. And so what can happen is that, that um, when you eat them, they don't break down well. You get lots of fluid coming into the gut and you get bloating and diarrhea or sometimes you can get constipation. And, um, and these aren't food allergies, these are intolerances. And FODMAPs are found in many different foods and wheat is one of them. So you know, it's not uncommon for people to find that they're sensitive to wheat. And that could be due to how much they have. So it could be they're okay with one slice, but if they have three or four, or if, if you have, for example, one sandwich in a day and then you have pasta and a muffin and they get the gut symptoms, whereas two pieces of bread are okay. So it does vary. Some people will have proper allergy to wheat or celiac, which is a different thing which would need to be investigated uh, by a doctor. But, um, but yeah, these definitely can be a group that, that are a problem. And finding out if they are involves a a, a, a diet, a, a diet modification where you remove them and you put them all back in slowly, and then in the end you come away with a plan in terms of how much of those foods you can have and which ones are a problem. And it's really helpful because often it means that you might have been avoiding a whole food group, for example. You might have been avoiding all dairy products, and then you realise actually I'm fine with cheese. It's just if I have a glass of milk, it's a problem. So yeah, I can do it. The fat, okay, yeah. So as long as I'm having a low fat version of You're okay, yeah. Fine. And that can sometimes be just not breaking down fat, but you know, your gallbladder just doesn't Well, that's specifically dairy. Dairy, okay. <laughs> yeah, so they're the different parts of dairy. So yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah. And it can be complex, for sure. And some people will react to the casing, so the protein component. So, um, so finding out's really worth it, isn't it? So that you think you don't have to deprive yourself. Of yeah, yeah. Perfect. yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, yay. <laughs> um, so yeah, finding out about, about those is, is worth it. So the second point we're going to look at is the idea that you know it's just you know you should be eating this optimal diet but you're tired and it's not always easy to do it so there's a couple of things I'd like to mention one is the idea of KISS which is keep it simple okay there's lots of idealized food plates out there you look on Instagram and you think everyone is eating these beautifully curated meals all the time but I just really encourage you to, to just keep it simple and just fuck focus on the nourishing foods. It doesn't have to be beautiful, it doesn't have to be elaborate. And quite often that little cycle can be something which gets in the way of eating really nourishing food. And, and it could be that you're just feeling tired. And when you're feeling tired, you just want a quick pick me up because you um, so you might reach for a, a less nourishing food. So when we talk about empty calorie food, that might be a food like a like a, a candy bar that has sugar, but not a lot of other nutrients to feed your mitochondria in it. So you feel tired, you eat less nutritious food, and then you have less energy in the tank 
or less energy to keep the mitochondria happy. And then you have less energy to prep food and then you'll eat a less good food again. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because if that, if, if energy gets in the way of prepping good food, then you have to be super prepared and super organized um, for what to eat on those days because it's because the nutrition can can make a difference to how you feel on those days so it is a bit of a cycle and it does yeah and the only way that you're going to overcome that sometimes is through prior preparation or having help or having someone else help getting getting on board with that um so keep it simple so the first thing is nutritious food you want b vitamins you want zinc you want all of those nutrients to feed your mitochondria so whole foods are generally going to be a better option. So an example of that is white rice versus brown rice. So brown rice, is because it's got the, the husk around it, it's got all the B vitamins still in it. But white rice, they've taken off the B vitamins because they've taken off the husk. So they're just reasons why whole food is often a better choice. So then it would be the same with whole wheat versus white flour. So if you can try and skew your food selections towards whole foods, you're more likely to get the nutrients you need. Choose less processed food. So processed food, microbiome's not as happy, and also probably less of those nutrients in, in there. You know, whiter, more refined, more packaged food, generally speaking, might have less nutrients. I love that one most of all. Never miss an opportunity to add a vegetable to a meal. Every time you sit down, it's an opportunity to nourish yourself well and get the nutrients you need. So all you can manage is a peanut butter sandwich. That's fine. Try and have a carrot with it as well. If you've gone, if you've gone to add a takeaway, fish and chips, add a spoonful of salad as well. Grate your carrot on the side. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. That's exactly going along that idea. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, never miss opportunity about vegetables. Spend extra money on quality oils. Remember, we talked about well, every you know, food's expensive. What's what's where are you going to get the best bang for your buck? And I'd say quality oils possibly are. Yes, they're expensive, but all our cells, um, on the outside of all our cells, are made up of essentially fats, or a fatty membrane. And that fatty membrane is kind of made out of the fats that we eat. So if we want the energy to be able to move in and, in and out of the cell well, then eating good fats is going to help to make that happen more. So extra virgin olive oil is expensive, but it's going to be better for you. It's anti-inflammatory, and it's not as high in oxidants it's not as high as damaging chemicals so it could be worth investing some of your food budget on that yes yes that's very true oh uh, yeah those those oily fish and that's why that kind of foundational diagram of oily fish is, is really helpful mostly avoid foods with added sugars so i'm not going to say never but um you know, build your diet around foods that don't have lots of extra added sugar in it. An apple or fruit, it's not really added sugar, it's what we call an intrinsic sugar, it's just in there. But I'm not, uh, however, if you can mostly avoid food that's got lots of added sugar, it's going to help reduce inflammation and also it's going to help to um, keep those blood sugars steady. Yes. These are just some top tips around um, strategies for a year. If, if, if the parent is tiring, some simple strategies for how to work with that. One is to spread your food prep throughout the day. So, for example, chop some vegetables in the morning, leave them covered, and then later on in the day, then you're going to cook, you don't have to do it all at once. Um, slow cookers, I don't think I could emphasize how useful they are. Um, slow cookers are especially good because, for example, if you're making something like a lamb casserole you can add in uh, lentils and legumes in that 
so you get less of the meat and more of the legumes, which is really good for you. You can add vegetables, you can put it all in there, you can tick all those boxes in that one meal, and it's all done, and you can batch cook with it as well, so you can have frozen meals with that. Um, planning, all these things probably you've heard before, but freezing meals, having good um, Tupperware, really basic things, just like having lots of good things to put your food in. So if you make extra meals, you can store it away nicely for the next day and store it in the freezer. Pimp your takeaways. So look, sometimes we eat takeaways and that's absolutely fine, but I don't necessarily, I think it's still good to think about the basic food principles. So if, for example, you have having fish and chips, have a few chips and still have salad. If you're getting a takeaway like an Indian or whatever, a butter chicken, you can always make that portion a little bit smaller and add extra vegetables. You can still keep some of these healthy food principles in, even with takeaways. So never miss an opportunity to have a vegetable. And I know some people mix salads and fish and chips, but you get used to it and it begins to taste good. And just notice if it makes you feel better, then you're probably onto a good thing. Add protein rich food to make your meals more nutritious. And I think that's what um, you were mentioning about nuts and seeds. So, you know, if you if you want to, to make your meal just, just a bit more nutritious, then you're adding nuts and seeds, adding things like natural yogurt, a bit of grated cheese is going to help to do that. Uh, good equipment, so slow cookers, microwaves, sharp knives. I know it sounds obvious, but that can make your life so much easier if you're having to chop up vegetables. Good chopping boards, yeah, good <laughs> juliennes or peelers, ones that work for you. <laughs> yeah, juliennes, those, yeah, exactly. Don't no, slice your hand off. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, and it makes it so much easier if you've got good equipment, doesn't it? It just it takes away some of the barriers. So, think about that, invest in that, and sharp knives and not super heavy chopping boards, just do everything you can to make it more workable and more enjoyable even. Yes. So you do, there's, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's a few things to consider with it. So firstly, when you eat them whole, even if that there's, a, there's wonderful fibers in them, which are going to be great for your microbiome. So there's always value in it. Um, they, it could be that if, if you really don't digest them well, or you've got a really fast metabolism, for example, you, you know, go to the toilet a lot, then grinding them would be helpful. Yeah, or even um, activating or soaking them. Um, yes, you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you can buy ground linseeds. Well, I will say one thing about linseeds, if you're wanting, if you're taking them for the fats, Okay, if you're taking them because they're high in those anti-inflammatory fats, then you want to um, grind them, keep them in the fridge, keep them out of sunlight. They're very sensitive fats and they're oxidized. So, um, so the, probably the key would be yeah, getting good fresh ones. Um, but there's a few more ideas there about um, ways to help. But the key thing is, is you have those good basic items in your pantry. Um, it, what if what is in your pantry and in your fridge is generally going to dictate what you eat. So if it's full of fast, you know, quick, if, if your pantry is full of biscuits and you're tired, you're going to eat biscuits inevitably, because it's a normal thing to do if you're tired. So as much as possible, stock your pantry with food that's going to nourish you as much as you can. So these are very general, but they're just some nice general ideas about easy, meals and they obviously you might have your own favorite ones but I guess what I'm saying is it doesn't have to always be complicated okay um you know scrambled eggs things like baked beans actually are really high in protein high in fiber and combined with bread actually quite a good combination if you want something super quick the kind of Buddha bowl idea in the picture up before that is a nice one as well where you just you might have some um leftover roasted vegetables so you know, doing things like batch cooking roasted vegetables, so you've got them for the week in the freezer. It's, uh, you know, a good dollop of those with some um, leaves and, and legumes as well, just 
chopping it all together. It doesn't have to look pretty, but it is going to be really nutritious. Things like mashed potato, uh, baked potatoes in a microwave, you know, really simple, especially if they've got the skin on them. That's going to give you vitamin C and good fiber. And mashing things like tuna or sardines or cheese, cheese with it is, you know, if you like sardines, you've got to like them. They're a real superfood. Um, just easy and nutritious. Um, the whole, whole grain wraps also a really good idea. You can, you can choose your protein. You will have egg or cheese or fish, canned fish, protein, and then you put your salad. A bit of healthy fats. Healthy fats are really good because they make the nutrients more absorbable. They have all those fat soluble nutrients are going to be taken up better by your body when there's a bit of extra fats. So, you know, just a wrap like that doesn't have to be complicated, but that nutritious and that's going to make you feel full as well. Usually, if you have a meal that has some protein in it, it's going to make you feel full for longer. Um, yeah, sandwiches. I mean, all those ideas work. Okay. And the final one is a smoothie. Now, I think eating food or proper food is great, but sometimes um, smoothies are super convenient and a great way to get lots of nutrients in. So that could be made with the milk or plant-based milk base, a piece of fruit, some whizzed up vegetables. Okay, so baby spinach or kale or any of those things can go in. You can put a tablespoon of your flax seed or your uh, ground seeds as well and even half an avocado. There's lots of ways you can do it. Um, you just need to find a way that suits you, the berries or whatever tastes you like. But smoothies, smoothies work as long as they're you know, with nutritious ingredients. Frozen bananas work beautifully in smoothies. Um, they really give it a nice texture. This is just a resource I thought I'd, I'd give you. Um, it's from the Healthy Food Guide magazine. The people know the Healthy Food Guide. It's a really excellent, useful resource. You can go online and have access to a huge amount of recipes and a lot of resources like this. Um, so I really recommend you have a look on them. They're generally healthy, nutritious meals, and they've got great ideas of, you know, around cost, costs of meals and also quick cooked foods. And this is just a very simple list they've got of really quick cosmic, quick cooked meals and they're using packaged sauces and so on. But basically the beauty of them is they've got that. They've got vegetables, they've got protein and they've got some healthy carbs. So if you're wanting a meal in a hurry, then um, they're nice options. And yeah, I would strongly recommend you have a look at them. And they also allow you, they've got things like FODMAP diets, vegetarian diets, you know, gluten-free diets. So you can find a, uh, recipes and inspiration, whatever your type of diet you're having. Um, the other one, this just some tips about quick prep legumes and so on, quick prep grains, sorry. So, you know, sometimes when you're tired, the idea of boiling up rice or cooking a whole lot of grains from scratch is quite tiring. So these are quite nice, simple ideas. So couscous, people ever use couscous? Yeah, you just pour boiling water when it's done. Mm -hmm. Buckwheat noodles, brown rice, quinoa, pup, uh, pouches. I mean, they're packaged, but they're fast and easy. And cups, if you just want a quick um, grain. Um, things like uh, organic black beans and lentils. Sourdough bread can be a lovely food to have around if you can tolerate bread. And the reason why is that it's got lots of probiotic um, components to it as well. And it just tastes nice. It's got, if you want to just make like a, a piece of toast with an egg or avocado on it, it just tastes nice and big thick sourdough bread. It's just, it's just yummy. And sometimes you can just freeze that and bring, bring out a slice for a quick lunch option. They're just some, some ways that you can get those whole grains in without too much um, effort. So there's some, um, for some people, having three smaller meals and snacks is a great way to go, but just keeping that food quite constantly in, in the system. And those are just some really simple um, snack ideas.
and that will acquire also quite nutritious. A boiled egg can work beautifully as a snack if you and it keeps you full for a long time if you like them. But the nuts and seeds, so I've said 30 grams just because it's probably good with nuts and seeds to think about the portion size. Um, because obviously if you eat a whole bag, it's going to be too much for your gut and it's also quite a lot of energy. So you're aiming for about kind of a handful a day. A lot of evidence suggests that that's kind of ideal in terms of protecting your heart health and diabetes risks and general good health. So they're just simple uh, snack ideas that shouldn't be too hard to put together. The really useful foods that you can think about having in your cupboards and these are useful because they tick some of the boxes of the of the criteria we talked about before they're anti-inflammatory they're um you know got good fibers the seaweed's got iodine in which is a really important mineral that we don't always get enough of um and then things like brazil nuts nice and high in selenium which is a really important mineral so those are just all good foods and if you can kind of build those into your diet, then you're going to be doing really well. So there'll be one or two you'll look at and think, ooh, but that's okay, just move on to the next one. I often tell people to eat sardines. I don't like them, but they're really good for you. So it's not sardines, then try something else, like salmon. That's all. That's definitely a good snack. Yeah. Okay, so that's a very good tip. So um, add that to the solid technique in bed for two days yep. and fatigue for six weeks. Oh. I was trying to vomit, couldn't vomit it up. Yeah, they are definitely the foods that. family, they um, they my brother in law had a whole plate of them. I didn't want to pour it. Oh she got a bit tired. <laughs> Has that, other people had problems with muscles? Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a shame. So, <laughs> so but definitely beware. Uh, They're super nutritious. Know, they, yeah. they, Lots of iron. iron. And it's rushing really. Yeah. Like, you won't always get it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's yeah, it's good to be here. You'll find yeah. it. And it really hurts. Um, <laughs> um, so, so these, so these are some more super, super star, star foods. foods. Um, uh, lots of them for all the different reasons I've given. And again, you might not find, you might think, oh, that's not my favorite. But if you can find some from that, and, and a lot of those, well, blueberries are quite costly. The frozen ones actually not too bad if you're just using a scoop here and there. But you know, a lot of those are more kind of everyday foods and really, really useful. Um, that was just the last thing about who to trust. So get your information from good sources. There's a lot of confusing and conflicting information out there. So um, registered nutritionists and dietitians are, are well trained with a science background, health and food guide. Information on FODMAP diets, that, that's, that's the best source for that. And there's just a website that talks about microbiome science, which is super interesting if you wanted to find more out a bit more about that. And they're all really good sources. Um, so just to summarize, we covered quite a lot of grounds and I wasn't able to go into a huge amount of details about everything, but it was a bit of an overview. But this has been my summary. Just firstly, the eating world doesn't have to be complicated. Um, so, but you really do need to be organized if you want to nourish yourself well at the whilst you're um, living with it. Um, nourishing yourself well and finding out what foods work for you, which has been illustrated very well by the muscles <laughs> anecdote, thank you, um, is key. And, you know, you're managing this condition generally for quite a long time. So, you know, really putting the time into finding out how to, you know, best find the diet that works for you is, is time well spent. Um, have a rainy day plan. 
So, you know, on those days where you're just not feeling great, are possibly the days you really want to get your nutrition right. So try and you know, think about that. And, um, and that, yeah, so that's just something to consider. And, you know, it's really important that your diet is not going to be a hundred percent all the time. And that's absolutely fine. Um, it's, but it's what you do most of the time that counts. So just kind of get the foundations right. And then it's absolutely not a problem if you go out for tea and have cake and, and you know, it's, that's just the icing on the cake, but just get the foundation right. And, um, and you, you're going to be able to, and then you're much more able to tolerate the bits and other things coming in than just normal life. And that really does depend, and it sounds obvious, but it really depends on what's in your cupboard and what's in your fridges. So just do an inventory and have a look and think, how do I want that to look? So that's me, that's my talk. So I'm more than happy to answer specific questions. <laughs>